So I'll be talking about uh, session types, uh, which I will get into detail about what those are. And uh, there's a joke in this. Uh, there's two jokes in this uh, title. Session types for Me, You, and Everyone We Know. Me, You, and Everyone We Know is a really cool movie from uh, maybe the early 2000s that uh, I will be showcasing some stuff from. Uh, but it also is about what session types are, which is that we're going to talk about distributed programming. Um, and actually, the session types I'll be talking about are really called multi-party session types, because there is no party like a multi-session party. Um, and let's see if this works. All right, there we go, yeah. Uh, so I, I always listen to a lot of music when I put slides together. Uh, just highly recommend this Vince Staples record. Uh, Bowler needs more hip hop anyway. So uh, highly recommend it. Summertime 06. It was made last year, though, just FYI. OK, so um, usually in talks, you know, I'm talking about programming language theory here in session types. But they come from the idea of the reasons they come through are because of what they call process mobility, um, but also distributed programming. And when I see every talk at most conferences about distributed programming, it's always about like tire fires and people really upset and you have to put Zookeeper somewhere. Uh, or they don't know how to set up or they don't understand why the third machine goes down or why um, you know, they're having issues in one region to the other or why some data from one data center is not going into another. If we could just think in one single way, if we can think of just about point-free functions in one computation cycle, we're going to be happy. But when we have to start thinking about many machines communicating, we uh, give up or we hope somebody else will do the work. Uh, I think, most of the time. So it feels like this, I think. But actually, for me, instead of tire fires and instead of uh, uh, you know, just a network failure catastrophe, messaging is a more complex but interesting beast. Um, what you see here is the, from a great film, uh, an old Russian film, I think from 19, 19, 18, 1921, something like this, uh, The House on Turbinaya Square by Boris Barnett. And in this film, uh, which is about a lot, lots of characters, you have this great, this great scene with all these people live in this apartment complex. Uh, this is like uh, social, uh, Soviet Union uh, early days. But communication comes from everywhere. You have people talking from, like, from uh, different floors this way. You have people uh, kind of up and down the stairs. Um, everyone is communicating, and it's very difficult. Uh, imagine this is a distributed environment. So. Session types, and I'll get to the formal definition, uh, came around uh, in the late 90s, uh, but comes from a, a, a you know, before by uh, Robin Milner, who created um, ML and, uh, and, a bunch of, and a bunch of other great computer science. But the early uh, session type work was actually geared toward two parties. You know, node A talks to node B. So if you look at this diagram here, this is actually from a, a paper that talks about the kind of original history of, of binary session types. Uh, and what they kind of look like, for those who maybe have never been experienced, these to me look almost like UML-y uh, you know, uh, graphs. Um, and what you see here is a typical bank scenario. We're going to get into a much more complex one with, with types involved. But imagine modeling these ideas. What, what is um, saying, I'm going to start a transaction? Um, we hear about these things all the time. But actually, things are not node A and node B anymore. You know, we, th those things are not interesting anymore. What's interesting is that everybody is talking to each other. All these nodes, all these data centers. So really what it is, it's about constant communication back and forth. Forever, we hope, right? But systems don't last forever, <laughs> right? And if you've seen the movie, there's a, it's much more to this than this. But maybe. But maybe since they don't last, for, maybe this communication doesn't last forever. <laughs> maybe they last for like 99.9% .9 uptime, you know, uh, as much as possible, right? That's, uh, <laughs> that's the most you can go back and forth, right? Um, so again, a little more information. Okay, so uh, Robin Milner uh, came up in the early 90s, uh, actually for many years before the 90s, before he worked on... Um, the Pi calculus, he had a thing called Calculus of Communicating Systems. You could say that Milner was working on, on CCS. You had uh, Tony Hoare working on uh, CSP, which you know everyone loves now. We, came, we all love it because Go has it or something. Um, so, but the Pi calculus came around in the, in the, you know, right around this book, late 80s, early 90s, um, as a model for computation for concurrent systems. And uh, Robin Milner had this idea. And actually, you know, how uh, dumbfounded that I was because I didn't understand things. When I first saw this book, Communicating in Mobile Systems, uh, I was like, whoa, Rob, Robin Milner's like really into cell phones. 
Uh, but processes move. Processes move. Uh, and they move from machines to machines, from machines to the same machine, to different cores. Things are complicated. Mobile mobility is actually what we're really expressing. Um, so Pi calculus kind of came along, came along later, and its biggest foundation compared to some of the other process calculi that was around was that we could actually pass the channels around. And we'll talk about a bit what higher order session types mean, and that's how they actually, actually works. OK, so uh, this comes from uh, a really cool uh, FAQ um, on um, what uh, Pi calculus really was and how it does, has some of the initial uh, formula. For, for what it meant. It was actually pretty, it's a pretty simplistic um, uh, way to view these things. So you have you know, parallel processes, you have weights. Um, it, the initial definitions of this looked at, the, looked at a very synchronous model. And when we talk about session types, it's all about asynchrony. Um, actually, adding synchronous work is, is extra work. <laughs> um, um, you talk about behavior, you talk about inaction, which is what zero does. The bottom one here comes from a paper uh, later on that actually kind of gets the really kind of basic foundation of what pi calculus was. You have inaction, you have send and receive, you have parallel computation. Uh, NL in write means branching, and we'll talk about that a little more. Uh, ca uh, case, uh, case is the actual branching, and NL in write is actually the choosing, the selection. So they're, they're duals, and we'll talk about duality, which seems to be a theme today. OK, so we talked about Robin Milner. Uh, obviously, he was the kind of predecessor of this work. Uh, but the, the person who actually created, the two people who really kind of founded session types uh, was Kohei Honda and Nobuko Yoshida. Uh, Honda died, uh, I think, in 2012. Um, but he left this amazing legacy that his wife, uh, Nobuko Yoshida, still is working on. She has these great students. She's at uh, Imperial College in London. And that's, uh, London is, for some reason, the kind of hotspot for all this work. So now you have a lot more people working around session types. Uh, so Philip Wadler has done a lot of work, and we'll talk about it here. Um, Frank Fenning at uh, CMU. Um, Simon Fowler I show here because I'll be talking. I, I write in Erlang every day, so I'll talk a little bit about a, a variation on session types in Erlang. OK, so multi-party session types. So a session is a series of interactions which serve as a unit of conversation. A session is established among multiple parties via a shared name, which represents a public interaction point. So what are the guarantees that session types give me? And uh, I think this is, you know, if, if these things are what you care about in a system, maybe we should start thinking about how to apply these to our real applications. So interaction of the session never incur communication error, communication safety. These are the same things you see in, in, in type theory, but we're looking at it in distributed, mecha uh, distributed mechanism now. Channels for a session are used linearly and are deadlock free in a single session. So we'll talk a little bit about linear logic very briefly, because again, this is a higher level talk, but we'll go into it. And what deadlock free also means for people in the distributed systems arena is liveness, that the eventual completion of a communication happens, uh, the operations happen. Uh, and then finally, the communication sequence in a session follows the scenario declared in the session type. So this idea of session fidelity. And we'll talk a little more a bit about that. So uh, in a lot of the work, and, and the session typing work from the 90s all the way to now, there are so many formulations, very different practical applications, um, and different avenues that people have gone in. There's no way for me to cover that all. But um, there are some, some I think, uh, um, substantial points that people keep making over and over. And one is, you know, so in session types, and we'll talk a little bit where it gets more complex, is there's all these guarantees, but these are intra-session guarantees. How do you start thinking about multiple dependencies, dependencies that you don't have control over? Maybe, you're de maybe you have a, a typed session, but then you have another application that's not. Uh, so maybe if people were familiar with gradual typing, you might deal with this idea of dynamic and static fragments. We'll talk a little bit about that. So uh, the type systems around session types as well are uh, a lot of the, um, the kind of proof comes from subtyping. And we'll see, you know, obviously subtyping has been around for a long time. You get some guarantees out of subtyping. But there are caveats in a, in a, distributed, in a distributed world with sessions. OK, so uh, again, we'll go into a little more like what these things are. So sessions are kind of geared to two main overarching types, they're called. So we have a global type, which plays the role of the shared agreement amongst all the peers. So this, this specific uh, global and local types come only when we talk about many parties. When we were talking about binary A to B, we didn't have to worry about what global communication means. I only have this local communication between two nodes. But, but now I have this idea of a, a full global play. 
So we look at some of the things here, and if you looked at the, it's a little bit more complex than the, than the uh, pi calculus uh, for, um, um, you know, variables that we saw earlier, but we have these very similar ideas. We have values, which have types, which, are, which is what u is here. We have branching, which again is a case statements, basically. You have parallelism. You have recursion. You have variables, and you have this n, which ends a signal, which ends a communication in a session. Um, so like, you know, just to think a bit off the bat, what's a great example, as you start seeing some of these things, of what sessions are really good for? Well, one uh, immediate example is like, as a node, say, uh, you know, say like in something that has, I'm a node that's a part of many, many applications. I do JSON processing, I do, um, you know, I do, you know, you name it. I'm doing checking, I'm doing testing, I'm doing all these things at once. How do I play a different role in different sessions? amongst many communications and many applications. So people who ever use like, things like Mesos and things, where you have many applications interacting with each other, how can you guarantee the things that we talked about that we have in session types? OK, so yeah. Uh, go to the next one. OK, so uh, there is a, obviously a, a bigger formalism at play. So uh, for all the work, uh, and there was formalism from the beginning, Philip Wather came in, and he, he basically applied he, you know, he applied propositions as types, and he said, there is a paper, and he created a paper, propositions as sessions. And in, in this paper, uh, uh, Wilder basically gets at some, some uh, really uh, simple things. So we're seeing some of the same things here. So the, uh, um, the, the XOR, which is the plus in the circle, um, is basically acting as selection. Uh, the ampersand is branching. You see this duality of what you can cover in these types. And here again is the same thing here, where you have this uh, duality that's at play. If I receive something, question mark, I send something. I have types, I have bool, I have end, I have some sort of prefix, I have an environment. Um, and I have two kinds of, uh, I have two kinds of um, qualifiers here. So linearity, which we talked about, is, is guaranteeing uh, uh, that one type stays linear throughout a, throughout a session. And unrestricted, which is actually for how nodes communicate with each other. Basically, are you a node on the network? Can we have a TCP communication? So in his work, he talks, you know, he basically, um, in, he formulates from the Curry-Howard isomorphism uh, with, by Frank Fenning, actually, he referenced the Frank Fenning paper, where initially we have propositions as types, proofs as programs, and normalization of proofs as evaluation of programs. But in terms of propositions of sessions, we have propositions as session types, we have proofs as processes, basically saying that each process which sends and receives data itself can be a proven concept. And cut elimination is communication. I won't go deeply into cut elimination, but it's the idea that I can, you can basically imply an inline proofs together based on assumptions. So when you're thinking about distributed nature of things, you have to think about causality. And when you talk about linear logic or talk about linearity, causality is a really interesting thing. Um, so in the original Honda paper, which this uh, slide references, uh, he talks about what works and what doesn't amongst types. But I'll give you a really simple example. So we say A sends, a, sends messages to B, sends a bool and C to B. If this is happening in parallel, I can't guarantee that, that what's happening in C to B won't affect what's happening in A to B. But with session types, what would happen? We would reject this. And there's variations if they do that at static time, or you could do that in runtime. But you guarantee that you cannot have a race condition. I don't need to quick check this, which you, know, you, find, you find race condition. That's great. I love quick check. I use it all the time from a day to day distributed systems, but what if I can have this guarantee that I break causality, it's over. This message won't pass. It's just, it will send back to the, re, to the, the sender itself, because the message always has to get delivered, but it gets sent back to the, the, uh, the sender itself. So that can't work. But another example, this can work. So the, uh, the, the less stands here act as partial ordering. They see this in some distributed list systems literature. But even though I'm sending, I'm using the same uh, message twice, if I can guarantee a partial order in the relationships, at least uh, in between certain ones, then I can guarantee causality, then this will pass. And the whole thing about session types, what you're getting, what you're getting like you get in type systems, you're saying in a distributed nature, in a concurrent nature, I can guarantee this and I can reject the other program. So sending routine take place in a strict temporal order. No conflict occurs between these two communications in spite of their use of a common channel. OK. So we have linearity. Uh, this is a whole topic in and into itself. I can't cover this in the amount of time, but uh, there's great work by Gerard on linear logic. I'll read this great Wilder quote that I think defines it best. Some of the best things in life are free, and some are not. Truth is free. 
Having proved the theorem, you may use this proof as many times as you wish, at no extra cost. Food, on the other hand, has a cost. Having baked a cake, you may, only, you may eat it only once. If traditional logic is about truth, then linear logic is about food. So you can't have your cake and eat it too, right? This is the problem. Like, this, is, this is what linear, linear types guarantee you. So we have these value types that are qualified as linear. So um, you can basically apply this idea that even if I start with some sort of Boolean here, that has to be the same Boolean throughout a session. That can't just change. I have to have that guarantee. There is an implementation in Rust, uh, a really cool paper, where they actually apply it to their affine typing system, which is weaker. And what basically the guarantee is with linear types is you're saying, I have to, have, I have to at least send that message exactly once. With affine types, I say, uh, I can maybe send that message once. So there are a lot of other properties in session types. Again, the papers are just, just go on and on. But we talk about bi-simulation, which is the idea of some sort of congruence amongst how operations work and how networks work. So um, a lot of the uh, original examples of session types were geared towards static, uh, so, you know, a static nature of things. But uh, we'll show, as I show in terms of monitoring, monitoring networks, the idea of bi-simulation becomes a really important factor because you can basically guarantee that you can actually, well, I guarantee, but you can see that two networks, if they apply the same processes over and over, are actually the same, and you can do optimizations there among, amongst uh, networks themselves. So I thought this was the coolest thing, and when I show the example, you can think about this, but one of the coolest things about session types is this idea of delegation. So if A is talking to B, sending and receiving messages, for example, for many reasons, maybe A is having, maybe uh, B is having some trouble, or B has, has another partner on the other line, it's talking to C. And actually, A and C need to talk, but maybe for reasons for locality, maybe for a lot of other reasons, we can't have them linked together. And we don't want to create a whole other separate session. We want to keep the session as one session amongst many parties. But for some reason, when we added these behaviors, let's say C didn't have what A had, or what B had, but B can basically proxy and delegate its channel. This is the idea of higher order session types. It can say, well, you can act as me. You can have the type specification that I have for a certain amount of time till the session ends. So the idea of delegation is really powerful. Actually, in the runtime versions, we'll see like the Erlang one, this is not implemented. It's actually a little bit hard to implement. But it's a, it's a really great idea. I mean, theoretically, it, and it, it does work. I mean, it's proven. So we call this higher order session type. And you can actually pass channels across. Uh, and even better, because channels, uh, as we've seen in languages that have implemented them, channels are not as strong as something like actors. So actually, all the movement now towards session types is actor-based systems. This gives you more out of it. So let's look at an example of a global specification. I'll show you a, a, a smaller way to do it. But we have Alice and Bob in a seller. Basically, uh, and I, usually the hello world for session types is the two buyer in a seller thing. I'm going to make it more complex. Why not? Let's do three buyers in a seller. OK. So what does this look like here? Um, you know, just to go back for a bit, you say, Alice is sending a book with a title to a seller, sends it back, sends back a quote. If the price is within Bob's budget, Bob notifies the seller and Alice he accepts, then sends the address. But if the price exceeds his budget, Bob will ask Carol to collaborate and create a new session. Bob sends Carol how much she has to contribute and delegates the remaining interactions with Alice and the seller to her. And then you go on. If Carol's contribution within her budget, she accepts the quote, notifies everybody else, et cetera, et cetera. So we can look at this as basically like the session type graph right? that we look at. Uh, you're sending a string, uh, you're getting back quotes, um, and you're playing roles. These numbers, 2, 3, 1, 2, 1, and we'll have a better example of this, are the roles that they play. In this case, Bob is playing two roles. Bob is, is uh, role ID 1 in the session between Alice and the seller. But Bob is uh, role ID 2 in talking to Carol. This is one. Um, these are Multiple sessions going on, but one channel of uh, one you know figurative channel of communication that's occurring. And you see here with these dotted lines, those are basically if they say okay, we can do these case statements. We can we can decide. So in a kind of uh, you know this is basically what the typing kind of uh, labeling looks like. Is that you know those those numbers again are the roles. So again, when I looked at this, uh, Alice is two. So Alice is sending a message to three, the seller. Sending a string. And then we go back and forth, the ints, this and that. So you see here when we have the OK or quit statement, that's basically a branching statement saying, I can make these decisions. So 
um, you know, and this is basically the, the clear syntax in the bottom with t equals, is you can actually define these syntaxes, the syntax of the entire communication channel in one of these strings. And I say here in the bottom how you have these two sessions. I have session A and session B. Alice is role two. These roles happen. But Bob acts as a different role in the second session. Um, so the cool thing you think, well, this sounds really great. Do I have to write this by hand? And you might look at something like this and go, right? You might go, like, did you see that? Like, how, I, you know, okay, process that, right? Uh, so you might say, you know, you might say what I think you might say. But if you look at it, like, in a simple example, it doesn't look that bad. Uh, and we'll showcase, uh, there's a, there's, you know, they knew as they were making this to make this, to make session types a practical idea that they were not going to get away with uh, people just writing proofs or writing this stuff by hand. Uh, so they, they have a language called Scribble. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll skip that for now. So uh, I'll get to Scribble in a second. Let me show some, I'll show a couple of real examples. So you know, what's really interesting about this is we have all the static verification, um, as we see here, where they were doing this thing of endpoint, endpoint projection. And there's still a lot of, uh, a lot of the work in, stat in session typing is around static verification. But people have realized, because when you actually get into these runtime distributed systems, that dynamic, I mean, uh, static uh, analysis with dynamic verification is really the way to go. So along came this work on the idea of monitoring processes and networks um, with different roles and different names uh, and cross-processes uh, cross between networks. What are shared channels and what are, what are session channels? So the biggest thing that happens is that when you think about monitored networks, when you think about monitors looking at, is this type correct or not, typing in this way is really about rejection. What is, what is types in general? It's saying, no, this does not apply. I can't union with this. I can't accept this because we want to keep all the, all the safety guarantees that we had originally. So the idea is that transparency properties ensure that a monitor network behaves exactly the same as the equivalent unmonitored network, which conforms to a specification. OK, uh, there's more in here. I'll skip over this for now. So we go into Scribble. Now we're actually looking at like, some coding ideas of how this works. Uh, so I have a basic uh, ping pong example here. So this is my global protocol. Um, a to ping from A to B, Pong from B to A. So this is simple. Actually, I'm just showing a binary session right here to keep it simple. Now, the actual way this applies from global types to local types is that global types um, project themselves onto specific local types. So what does a local type look like? It looks like this. So for A, A will only have to ping to B and ping from B, and B will only ping from A and Pong to A, right? So think about that. This is the global. I only have to write this, by the way. So what the Scribble language has allowed us, and what they've done in a lot of these applications for session types, I write this, I basically get this parsed to me for free. And this is what I can do static, static compilation with. And still, and then in runtime, I can look at a global channel to make sure that this is always true. Because this is actually what I want. This is just what happens. OK. So here's an example. Uh, there was some work being done by, um, at the Imperial College. They got like a $4 million grant to do some work with uh, the OCEAN, the OOI, I think it's called, the Ocean Observatories Initiative, to, uh, who is a you know, big sensor network, uh, data coming in from, from you know, under, the, under the sea, under the oceans. Um, so they, you know, here's an example of a protocol system that they wrote with this extra special bit of interruptibility, which is basically a user, any user coming in, saying, I want to interrupt the flow of this communication protocol and actually give you new data, new updates. I'm not always going to create a session with you. I'm just going to come in once in a while. So they've added this ability to have interrupt. And you see here that you can basically apply, do I pause uh, with the dotted lines kind of say is that I can have these choices. When I interrupt, do I pause and resume? Do I stop? Do I have a timeout when the channel uh, de uh, delays for too long? Uh, so you see some of the stuff they wrote. So they wrote a Python. So that, you know, as we went to dynamic types, one of the biggest reason we had people wanted to use sessions dynamically is because, well, most people use Java, most people use Python, and you know, distributed systems also have a lot of libraries that we don't actually want to screw with. So can we do something in Python to actually just say, give you a global protocol, apply this, your machines will just get this program, and it will apply these types, and we'll create a little API around it. So they created basically an API using decorators in Python. Kind of like FP, right? And what they did, if you, look at, if you look at this, but if you look at any of the protocols that we've seen, even the ping pong example, what do they look like to you? To me, they look like finite state machines. 
And actually, this is all what it is. So if you had, you had, you had, uh, you know, you had uh, CPS, you had, you know, CSP, I mean, you had, you had, uh, you know, all these, these various things. So I give you a new one, which is CFSM, Communicating Finite State Machines. And this is what this is. It's actually what it's called. And actually, in their implementation, they had some bottlenecks in the beginning because they were generating all these FSMs on the fly. They now generate them on the fly, but they store them basically like in a distributed hash table. So they just choose as what FSM. And when I'm saying FSMs here, I'm not saying you're writing the FSMs. You create the global spec, it will give you the local types, and based on the local types, it will create finite state machines for you. OK, I'm going to go look, uh, quickly through this example, uh, so I only have a few minutes here. So we have an Erlang example here. This is modern session Erlang. Uh, works very much in the same way, except that because it's Erlang and you have actors, you have this beauty of uh, having monitors for free. You don't have to create them on your own. And what you have is this, uh, this, in this example, he uses this thing where he actually keeps track. Every monitor has a track of what session you're in and what role you play. So I'm A, I come online to start a session. I can go look up my table and go, I play these roles. I do JSON processing. I do this. Uh, and you see here basically how it works. You have generation. Configuration is the step where I, I take my global protocol from Scribble and go and create local, local FSMs, initiation, communication, detection, and termination. Um, Skip over this, but basically the same idea of using a buyer system for monitors. So to kind of wrap up here, we're talking about this kind of gets into a little bit of future work. So I'm really interested in the idea you have the static uh, compilation process to, to make sure that these local types adhere to your global protocol. And there's actually real world examples of this, as I said, in the Erlang example and the stuff they're doing with sensor networks. It makes a lot of sense. Sensor networks, you don't know what, what you know, you have all these nodes communicating. You want to have guarantees. But there's actually really great work where they have thoughts around gradual typing and session types. This just came out recently. I was so surprised to see this, because I had uh, this was my idea, actually. But it's not, because they took it from me. <laughs> um, but in these things, they have this idea of using coercion. There's a whole world of blame calculus, where blame, they use this in gradual typing, where they can put blame on things that might be runtime errors. But what they can do here is because instead of using subtypes, because subtypes might not guarantee all the things that you, you wanted to guarantee, they can use coercion to create more proper types. And basically, it's basically cutting the tree down. It's doing some sort of deforestation to remove what kind of types you might have across the channel. Then there's work, I mean, we're talking about these are behavioral types. I mean, what these FSMs are are behaviors, automated behaviors. Uh, and what, there's a word that I think came up in a lot of the work, but more in the recent work, is this idea of choreography. So we're talking about choreography of types. So that some of the newer work in session types is we can't look at it in this kind of horizontal view that we've seen, like we've thought of distributed programming, because it's actually performance overhead for, for some of this stuff. That's still like the big paradigm here. But what if I think of things in graphs? And actually in graphs, I can actually make what might be two or three sessions into one session. I can basically find that there's some bi-simulation uh, um, coherence. There's some structural congruence to make this work, more so in a graph. And so I think about things. I go, we see some patterns here. There's obviously really cool work with contracts and third-party interaction. But how can we do, so everything you saw in terms of types, we're still talking about, did I send a string, a kind of string, a type of int, a type of number? But what if you can create behavior, especially in this parallel environment of static and runtime, with runtime monitoring? What if I can say, I want to be in a session where I have to implement a certain kind of consistency here? If not, reject me. If this thing is not communicating Paxos, then I'm not in. And I, how I can do that and guarantee those things. And then I say even more so, and what I've been looking at, is in a lot of the examples I see around session types, everything is really geared toward, well, I know I'm going to have nine nodes or eight nodes, and I know what they're going to do, and I'm going to apply, I'm going to apply these uh, behaviors, these local types, I'm going to do this projection to them. But what if I'm in a gossip system with nodes coming from anywhere, or nodes that I'm just picking up any time that I can? If I have access to nodes, I will bring them in. What if they've only partially applied a behavior? How can you look at the gradual typing work and the contract work to, to justify those means? Uh, so I think as we get into, uh, m I think these are the really interesting things here. Uh, and I was talking to one of the professors who works on this stuff. They're really looking at how to um, apply sessions for consensus, how to apply for these, these more, basically take behaviors away from just value types and into uh, distributed data types, and how to apply that the same way. So this is, I think, where the work is going to go. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, I'll send these slides out. 
you can read much more than I have and, uh, you know, just dive in. So thank you.